This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Mercier. And we are joined this week by uh, composer and performer uh, Corey Dargle. Thank you so much for joining us this week, Corey. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, as, as Sam was saying before the show, one of the reasons we were so excited to have, have you on is that when we had uh, a, a, we used a piece of yours as a pick of the week f- a few weeks ago when we had Rob Deemer on the show, uh, he was talking about several pieces that he wanted to put into an anthology of music that would represent the 21st century, and he, he selected a piece of yours, and we really dug the piece that we listened to, uh, and so we decided that we needed to have that, that guy on the show. Um, so we're, we really we really enjoy your music, and we're really glad you, you joined us this morning. Um, a, a lot of the observations that are made about your music have to do with um, the the intersection between classical music and popular music. And I always uh, it whenever we talk to people that are working in that kind of music it always strikes me as interesting that that they don't find that intersection nearly as interesting as other people do. Um, So uh, I'm wondering if you can, you can talk about uh, where, where you, you place your music or whether you even think about that. I I guess that's kind of the interesting thing is that I think musicians don't often think in those terms. Well, for me, it's, um, As Steve Smith pointed out in a New York Times profile of my work recently, um, the, uh, I mean, he asked me a similar question, and my response was, are you really going to ask me that? (laughs) And um, and he said that, that, you know, I agree with him that that, uh, that classical critics um, and some some listeners um, use the intersection of pop and classical as a sort of shorthand that... I think ends up sort of dismissing more important and more intricate and just more interesting aspects of an artist's work. I mean, to say that an artist is doing something that lives between classical and popular music is not really all that specific. And so I think when artists resist that, or when artists respond to that um, categorization with some reservation, it's it's because it simplifies things, I think. Um, and and maybe sometimes it might discourage um, further uh, immersion and evaluation of the uh, into or of the artist's work. So I don't think there's any question that um, that composers who are my age and younger um, are embracing all of the music that they've been influenced by and that they've listened to um, in their lives. And I don't think there's any question that everyone has heard popular music and probably lots of it. Um, so, you know, the, the, the idea that, um, that there should be a distinction between classical and popular music, uh, not to mention other types of music, um, you know, from other cultures or, other, um, uh, you know, sound art, uh, indeterminacy, all of these things are now available to us as potential influences. And so uh, it doesn't seem so outrageous or, you know, exciting to me that uh, uh, that a composer is using influences from pop and classical music. Um, I, would, I would say that, though, technically speaking, um, when you talk about the tools of popular music and even commercial music, uh, the... Uh, I mean, I, I guess I like to use the word commercial music when I'm talking about these tools. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I mean is what I'm referring to is, um, is sort of uh, production techniques, um, multi-track recording, uh, uh, sort, sort of high-quality high um, uh, sort of pop sheen production values, um, which is, you know, that there's an old example of... of uh, Bjork's uh, soundtrack to Dancer in the Dark, where she's got this orchestral overture or something, uh, which is the first track on the album. Mm-hmm. And they've produced it in such a way that uh, I was talking with a friend of mine who's also a composer, Eve Beglarian, about this, this production, this track on the album, and how if you know, more classical music was produced this way, was recorded and produced this way, uh, then it might reach a much wider audience 
than it does at the present time. Um, so I think I would, I would uh, talk about pop and commercial music techniques, but not, um, not sort of content, really. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, as, a, as a quick side note, I did a marching band arrangement of the Dancer in the Dark music. <laughs> just, just as an FYI, it was a pretty enriching experience. Um, I, I agree exactly with what you're saying, but there's another aspect uh, that I found in your work that I find interesting, and it relates to the pop music world, but in a different way. Because to me, you come across in process and like the way you seem to come up with your stuff and the way it comes across to me is like a singer-songwriter model. Um, the pieces are often, um, they hinge upon sort of the uh, character and charisma of you and your voice, and they're written for you and done by you, you know what I mean? Um, and, yeah, that, and, and that's something that doesn't really, you know, <laughs> that to me is something that classical music would be more resistant to than the, the idea of using multi-tracking or something like that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it still comes back to, to technique and ways of working for me, though, more than content. Um, but yes, I think, uh, I mean, as you probably know, virtually all of my work is written for me to sing, mm -hmm. even when it involves um, other performers, other musicians. Um, and so that way of working is definitely coming from the singer-songwriter tradition, uh, where my persona um, is, is a, part of the, a, a part of the music. And I think that came from me being extremely dissatisfied with working with classically trained singers um, who, in my experience early on as a student, um, had, had difficulty uh, with groove-oriented music, had difficulty with rhythm, had difficulty with pitch precision. And um, I'm sure not all of them are like that, but it seemed to me that this was not something that they're taught uh, to do well. And, you have no idea uh, to the extent to which you've just endeared yourself to Sam, by the way, <laughs> by saying all those things. <laughs> yeah, and I, I could totally see also how you might get frustrated with no rhythm or pitch. Or <laughs> sorry, so I started did, writing I these started these pieces. Go ahead, so, I started, uh, so I started writing these pieces for myself to sing, and as I was, you know, uh, cultivating my own uh, both artistic and physical voice uh, through these through this process, uh, I just started writing music that was very idiosyncratically for my voice, and that was the way into the singer songwriter tradition for me more than um, more than wanting to present a, a sort of biographical or or personal uh, portrait of myself. Um, right. And so, in 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 the in the personal stuff and the the seemingly autobiographical stuff, I like to play around with that. I like to play around with notions of sincerity and uh, autobiography and um, and the persona of the singer songwriter. So I'll often take um, I'll take on subjects, and I guess by subjects I mean characters who are not me. <laughs> And who, in many cases, I may not relate to, and then uh, try to find a way into that, into those characters and into their behavior, um, so that I'm I'm really sort of, I hope, um, subverting the more traditional approach to singer songwriter, uh, to singering songwritering, uh, mm -hmm. by removing my sort of my ego, in a sense, from. Uh, from the process of, of, of writing these songs, coming up with lyrics and coming up with characters and stories and, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that I think a lot of, a lot of writers do anyway, is to combine fiction and nonfiction. And, and that's interesting for me. And, 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 and yet, uh, people listen to my songs like they listen to songs of any, almost any other singer songwriter. And they just assume that these are songs about me and uh, and they feel sorry for me or they feel sympathy for me and they uh, they mistakenly think that this is my life that I'm singing about and these are my feelings that I'm singing about. And that is uh, very rarely the case. <laughs> right. 
That's for, for me, it's even more a consideration of sort of, uh, it's not that it, it seems like it's expressing you uh, in a personal way, because I guess I'm thinking of you as a composer composing art music, and maybe not every listener really puts themselves in that perspective, but it's the, just the using, the unification of, uh, of coming up with the music part and, and uh, combining it with the way your voice works and poetry, to me. I like your poetry, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. Well, that's interesting because I, I don't feel, I, I have uh, written in the past, in the very distant past now, about, um, about why I feel like poetry is not good for songwriting. Hmm. Um, in other words, um, you know, there's a tradition in the art song world of setting poetry to music. Right. And I feel pretty strongly that... Um, any poem that's written as a poem uh, stands on its own, obviously. And I am more skeptical of a composer imposing his or her own uh, sort of will onto that poem than I am of a composer writing his or her own lyrics or taking, taking words that are more pedestrian uh, uh, like I've done with with uh, the piece that we'll talk about later, Last Words from Texas, mm -hmm. uh, taking other people's words that are not meant to be poetry, um, but that, yeah, but that are more pedestrian in a sense. So right. I would stay away from, from poetry, even though there are a lot of, I think, great, you know, great examples of, of art song music that has successfully set poems in ways that I think are pretty compelling but just in principle, I stay away from it because I feel like, I feel like the poet has said what he or she wants to say and doesn't need my uh, contribution to make that. You know, my contribution I feel like doesn't really add anything to that, and and I worry more about it detracting from the poem as a whole than about, uh, you know, potentially adding some other yeah. layer to it. That's really interesting. That's actually something, I think one of my very first composition teachers told me something very similar when I told him I wanted to write some vocal music and was looking for some text. He told me that I should make sure that whatever text I picked, it was something that I felt like I could add to and not just you know take this thing and set it on top of some music, but that I could actually add to it. And he, he kept emphasizing to me that the best poems often don't make very good texts for, for music. Yes. Um, yeah. And and if uh, and for me, it also extends to cover songs. If I'm going to do a cover song, um, it's going to be a song that I think is not the best song in the world. <laughs> right. That's really interesting. That's an interesting. So it's idea. not a compliment you covering some song. Right? Well, it's not a. It, it's it's not an insult. Yeah. Um, I mean, oftentimes I'll pick songs by artists that I really like, but mm -hmm. they're they happen to be the songs that don't speak to me as strongly as as other songs by the same artist so i feel with those with those songs i can add something without um you know without the anxiety of feeling like well what how could i possibly top the original right right that you've got right. something different to to add yeah I'm, I'm curious about what you you think is the difference i know a lot of times you write your your own text and then other times um, you, you like, for example, in the piece that we're going to listen to at the end of the show today, uh, you're taking verbatim text from uh, another source. Is how do you see that process is different, or do you see that process is different between writing your own stuff and using uh, the the writings of other people? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, with I guess with my own work my own lyrics, um, my process is uh, to create the music first without thinking of what lyrics or what melodies would go with those uh, accompaniments. Did I just say that right? I feel like I may have said something weird. Anyway, uh, to start we'll with... We'll get our fact checker on it. <laughs> to, to start with the accompaniments, um, which is not, you know, accompaniment for me is not meant as a an insult. Uh, it's... Um, in fact, that's why I write the accompaniments first, because I want them to be interesting and compelling and intricate in and of themselves. And only after I've I've written the, the musical accompaniments do I then think about, okay, what kind of lyrics would I write to go with this? 
and what kind of vocal melody would I write to go with this? Uh, so that's the way I usually work, um, and that's the way I always work when I write my own lyrics. But when I'm using other people's um, words, uh, there's more of a... It's like I know, I know what the words are going to be before I start working on the music. Um, and so even though the, the musical accompaniments still happen before I figure out how to set these words to the music, I know what the words are beforehand. Mm -hmm. So there may be a difference in that respect in, um, in the type of music that I come up with to relay these texts to people. Right. Um, yeah, the words influence might seep into your generation of the accompaniment material. Yeah, they they might. Um, they probably do, but I hope in a very subtle way because I don't. I'm not interested in anything heavy-handed or, or uh, extremely dramatic, musically. In other words, um, hmm. I, I want the text to communicate whatever drama and intimacy and emotion there is to communicate. And for me, the music focuses as, or the music um, acts as almost as a way to sort of cut back on the emotion. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes in my own lyrics, I'll use humor and sort of tricksterism and wordplay and things like that to also cut back on uh, on emotion uh, because I don't want to be. I guess I want to leave things as open as possible for listeners and. Um, given that a lot of the lyrics and the uh, other people's texts that I use already deal with fairly dark and extreme, um, sometimes depressing um, and highly emotional uh, content, uh, I feel like the music um, should cut back on that so that the audience, so that the listener doesn't feel too incredibly manipulated by, uh, by these very heavy uh, topics. Um, right. That's that's something I, I think I think um, we've all observed in a lot of your music is that you have these really a lot of times very intense subjects uh, of the text, and then the the music tends to uh, exist in kind of a, a dissonance with that. And I I think, like you said, it it keeps it from being this um, like kind of morose, overly romanticized. Uh, you know, manipulative, I think, is a good word, uh, piece. And I, th I think it's also a really interesting cognitive dissonance between mm -hmm. those two uh, to kind of reconcile those two ideas. Um, so that's, that's, that's interesting, yeah. though, thinking about the the music as a regulating force for the emotion, motive quali quality of the words. That's, a, that's interesting. Yes, well, I think... Um, I think it's a it's also a way to get listeners into something mm -hmm. that you know um that they might not otherwise want to deal with yeah. uh so a lot of times i I'll use humor or I'll use this you know upbeat music um and and music that's fairly flat emotionally uh but that has a drive and a groove um to 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 bring people into the to the topic and to sort of uh, you know, I hope uh, let their defenses down if they're feeling at all anxious about hearing songs about clinical depression or voluntary amputation or hypochondria. And I think if if I can do that successfully, if I can get people into it, uh, then I I think that as a, as my pieces progress, um, I mean, my goal is to uh, to make these what may seem to be at first sort of alienating. Uh, topics and uh, unrelatable behavior to become more and more relatable as the pieces go on uh, and to 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 allow my audiences to to maybe see the connections between them and these characters uh, to see the ways in which these characters are, are sometimes a little like them and vice versa so um, for me the way to do that is through humor and craft and um, and and the, the the counterpoint as you as you said mm -hmm. between uh you know pretty upbeat uh, uh often i hope beautiful and and almost always consonant uh music that accompanies these these uh lyrics i do have you one know, Corey, other question I, 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 
find it refreshing that uh, we're talking to a guy who makes claims about the way their music, they want their music to touch and affect people and the message and this kind of thing, and actually has a place to stand to make those claims. <laughs> because I have a beef with composers who make the kind of claims you're making, but don't write vocal music. And they somehow think that, you know, my chamber orchestra piece is going to communicate all this stuff just, you know, with the violins and the oboes and stuff. <laughs> and it doesn't. And, uh, and so it's refreshing to talk to someone who is uh, in the composer world and uh, has a more realistic view of what can and can't be transmitted through music. Um, well, when you're talking about uh, absolute music or, or uh, no, maybe not absolute music, but music that doesn't have text or any other any other thing to hold on to, then uh, I, you know it's one of the it's probably the only art form, maybe the only art form. Maybe dance is in there a little bit, but but music seems to be the only art form that can actually be so abstract and yet. Uh, move us so much yeah. um, and I think it was Mendelssohn who said something like um, uh, the music is not uh, the music means what it is not what it says and right. I think a lot of composers would be well served to keep that in mind um, I think you know writing speaking about your work and writing program notes and uh, things like that are, are fine if you want to say, you know, what inspired this piece. But I think any time a composer gets into this area of saying, uh, this is what my piece will achieve and this is what I hope it will achieve, I think you let have to be really careful. To... Let me or, tell yeah, you, let me tell you how to listen, feel. right? Yeah. Um, but uh, I think you have to be really careful, and I, myself included, you have to be really careful when you're saying, you know, this is what I... You have to say this is what I hope it achieves, and you have to have some... Uh, you know, humility and some openness to the possibility that you're wrong and that uh, other people might take the music in a different way. So for that reason, for me, it's really great to, to try and create something that's as open to as many interpretations as possible. Yeah, um, yeah talking about uh, instrumental music and, and some different oh, ways... Oh, I going. just wanted to say something else, though. Yeah, go ahead. Speaking of composers who, uh, <laughs> who have... Uh, uh, who express something about their music that their music uh, should achieve? I once worked at a at a nonprofit, and uh, there was a grant program for composers. And I remember one. I will never forget this one composer uh, submitted an application and claimed that the purpose of his music uh, was that he wanted to write music that could be performed with gusto. <laughs> Yes. Well, you know, how to talk about music is something I think they should work harder at training young composers um, in school, actually. And speaking of school... Just all musicians. Yeah, all musicians. Well, but then you have the other, you know, you have the other extreme of the visual artists talking about their work. And if you've ever listened to a 21st century visual artist talk about his or her work, it's, uh, you know, it's like art speak is, uh, is insane. And oftentimes <laughs> right. it's like they... they they can talk and talk and talk and then say absolutely nothing. Yeah. And then you look at the work and you're like, oh, wow, you didn't need to say anything. This is really great. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, so I don't is. know. I, I agree with you about I agree with you about composers needing to be more comfortable talking about their work. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of times it's just it's just a matter of preparation. Like if you can prepare, if you can write down something about your work and, and sort of memorize it or at least, you know, spend a lot of time writing it down, uh, then it's, it's easier to talk yeah. in front of an audience. I think a lot of times composers are just not prepared, and then they'll get asked a very simple question that they're not prepared. You know, they're thinking that they're going to get asked these very complex questions, you know, because they're, com <laughs> they're the composer, and, and then they get asked a question like, so, um, uh, what, uh, so, so what, is this, what inspired this piece? <laughs> <laughs> or so what was it like growing up in Texas and how did that shape your work as a composer? And so they get thrown these uh, surprise questions and I don't know. It's uh, public speaking is, you know, people are more afraid of that than they are of death, according to some studies. <laughs> well, I think in, in a lot of ways, you're kind of more prepared for that kind of thing than a, than a lot of composers because 
you're uh, a performer and in particular a singer so you're used to kind of standing in front of people with nothing separating you except the microphone and you know stand and deliver uh to an audience and uh, i think maybe uh that has prepared you a little bit more for that than maybe some other composers Um, but i've also had my fair share of of uh of uh questions that i wasn't prepared for so i've i've learned to be you know i've learned to answer the question i wanted them to ask me if they don't (laughs) answer the question (laughs) they don't ask the question i wanted them to ask you'd make an excellent politician (laughs) Um, that that actually leads me to this a a question that that i had for you about um you know writing for yourself you mentioned earlier that you're almost always writing for yourself to sing with um whoever you're working with or with electronics um and i'm wondering if your music if, if you ever um, give your your music to other people to perform, or, or what you think about that, because you've you've written it so specifically for yourself. Well, I'm open to the idea. I think there's something slightly academic about it that sure that I'm not interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it would be about particular performers. It would be about you know not just give not just making this work available to. Right some company some ensemble and i don't know them and i don't know their singers but um but i have written pieces for you know specific pieces for art song singer you know for for people who are in art song groups and uh like my condoleezza rice songs which you can listen to at condysongs.com are are written for an art song duo and so um, and I also have a piece called Sexual Side Effects, which is written for uh, a Baroque soprano with a chamber ensemble. And um, I'm open to writing more of those songs, but I, it's, a very different, it's a very different way of writing for voice than I would write for myself. So if I were going to give my own, like the music that I write for myself to other singers, uh, I mean, it's almost unthinkable to me, but, um, but there are, I think two or three singers that i know who might be able to do it but the question is what's the point i mean if i can you know if i can sing it then what's the point of of getting someone else to sing it it just seems like an academic exercise i have an answer to that question yeah um we we, we (laughs) actually the the pick of the week we used of yours we were talking about this very topic of like you know is there a score for this could you like give this to a violin player and and a baritone and come up with this and we of course said no and i stipulated that if somebody did this song they wouldn't be doing this piece they would be doing a cover of that piece because it's so connected to your voice that if they were to do it they'd have to figure out a way to make it connected to their voice does that make sense uh, i don't know Uh, you uh, you have erroneous information because Mm -hmm. there is a score and it has both my part and the violin parts and all the looping parts and everything is very clearly notated so cool. it would be possible to give it to some other singer and see if they could do it but i think the 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 issue is um that it's a, it's a very idiosyncratic vocal part and to to deal with the the kind of syncopated rhythms and the odd meters and the combination of those two things and also the the clarity with which i want the words to be delivered um and the ability to use a microphone in a way that's more than just having it in front of you. Um, you know, these are things that I, I just don't know a lot of classically trained singers who can read this music that this that is this intricate and this complicated. I don't know a lot of those classically trained singers who could do the other things, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, there are some. I mean, Melissa Hughes will be singing, uh, will be singing an arrangement of Last Words from Texas, which is the piece that we'll be listening to later uh, for the ensemble Newspeak. Um, and she's one, of, she's one of those singers that I would, I would hand off my work to uh, and say, I think you can sing this. And, uh, and it, I might need to work with her on you know, shaping things a little bit differently for her voice and her delivery, um, but, uh, but maybe not. I mean, I, I, I totally trust her and she's, she has a great sense of rhythm, and she has a very clear delivery. And uh, so, th- you know, there are some out there, uh, some people out there. And I'm sure that if I knew people from other cities, um, 
you know, if I spent some time in, in cities other than New York, um, I would probably find people in those cities too. So I'm sure there's a handful, if not more, singers who could do it. I just don't, I, you know, why don't we wait until I'm, you know, until I lose my voice or I'm too old to sing anymore <laughs> or I, that, that's just my, you know. So it's my, safe to say you feel pretty protective of your pieces. I, I feel protective of, um, I, yes, but, but only because I've had experiences where, um, where the words don't come out and mm -hmm. that the meaning is lost and the singer is lost and, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I think it has to do with the way that I write for my own voice. It's, it's just too weird for, for some singers to handle. And the challenge of, I mean, it, it's not meant to sound weird, of course, and I hope it doesn't when I sing it, but when other singers sing it, it often does. It, it, it sounds you know, really forced and uh, like they're tentative and uncomfortable the entire time. And, um, that's not the, that's not been the case with Melissa, but um, other singers I've worked with that's that has been the case. And this is years ago, so I'm not talking about anything recent. But but I am protective of my work in that sense because I, the last thing I want is for people to hear a song and not be able to follow the words or bury their head in a program to read the song lyrics when they should be watching the performer. Yeah. Um, so. Right. Well, uh, I, I, I think that everybody, with, with the possible exception of Nate on the panel, has a hard time um, relating to that sensation because we don't come up with lyrics and write songs in that same way. So this is, it's very interesting to me um, to, to think about your pieces that way. You know, I never have to worry about whether or not people can understand the text. You know, I'm worried more about other things that are just as important. Because um, you don't use texts? I don't use text. I mean, I've done some yeah. settings, but it's not my thing the way it is. Yeah. It's more or less your kind of your thing, at least at this point in your career. Um, speaking of this point in your career, you're going to have a very active summer, I understand. Uh, lots of performances coming up. Um, this is the plug away section of the show, Corey. So tell us what you're doing this summer. <laughs> well, this. Uh, I, I'm a member of, a, of an experimental theater company in Brooklyn, and we are performing uh, a piece called Get Along Little Doggies. Um, and you can find out about that at laboratorytheater.org. Uh, late June at the Performing Garage in New York City. Um, and then after that, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm going to be in residency at a lot of places working on these really large-scale collaborative projects that I have, um, uh, three of them. <laughs> And um, and we're talking, you know, evening length pieces that involve dance and theater and music and film. And cool. so um, uh, I've got a music theater piece about people with messianic delusions that I'm working on with the novelist Andrew Sean Greer from San Francisco and the theater director Emma Griffin from New York. Uh, I've got a, uh, uh, a piece about... Uh, fables about global warming, which is being created with um, the choreographer Carol Armitage and the, the designer director Doug Fitch, who you may know for his work on Le Grand Macabre that the New York Philharmonic did a while ago. Um, and uh, we're doing residencies in Texas and McDowell, and you know, it's going to be a long. Uh, I'm going to be going, I, I have a feeling I'm going to be not performing a lot because my time is going to be devoted to uh, working on these these large-scale projects and collaborations are, are hard. So um, exciting but hard. So um, I, I do know that uh, Newspeak is going to be performing, is going to be presenting the premiere of the acoustic arrangement of Last Words from Texas on... Uh, Ah, I don't remember the exact date, but it's sometime in November in uh, Washington, D.C. So that will happen. Um, but other than that, I'm really, I need to devote my time to these projects. And also, uh, I may, in fact, be recording a new album in the next six months or so. So uh, I have a lot of work to do that doesn't involve um, public performances. Although I wouldn't turn any 
down necessarily <laughs> if, <laughs> if they uh, they were offered to me. Right. Who would? You know? Um. Yeah. Well, I so. Know some uh, who would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's cool to hear about all the different hats that you wear as well, with, between performing and doing all these different kinds of collaborative works. I really love working with other um, other disciplines, people in other disciplines. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like it, it really uh, it, it's really an influence. Um, not that's not it's it's really inspirational to see how um, other people in other art forms address the same sort of things that I'm addressing in music. Um, and I do I just really enjoy collaborations because when they work, um, they end up being much greater than the sum of the parts. So it's a really a really wonderful experience to do and. Um, I'm fortunate to have the resources in terms of grants and awards to to proceed with this for the next probably year, maybe longer, uh, without having to worry too much about getting a lot of performances to pay the rent. Um, nice. We're, we're happy about that as well. Mm -hmm. I've also been, I also wanted to say too that um, that I went to school at Oberlin Conservatory and Oberlin College had uh, you know. A great, there was a great relationship between the composers, so I would not say the, music, the performing musicians, but the composers at Oberlin and uh, other creative artists in the dance and theater worlds there. And so, you know, I first, I, I just, you know, I go to see a lot of different stuff, and I'm, in some ways, I'm like more interested in other disciplines than in, in music, <laughs> um, because, yeah. because. We know how you feel. Music often doesn't doesn't address everything it address. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I yeah, but I find I find that uh, composers and uh, you know there are there are a, a handful well more than a handful there are too many composers and performing musicians who don't really go to see a lot of interdisciplinary work and don't educate themselves about the other disciplines and I think that's something that's a real shame. I think um, we could uh, we could t really benefit from that and learn a lot from from interacting with other artists and seeing how they work and seeing how they solve problems that are similar to the problems that we have to solve as musicians and composers. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's a shame uh, in and of itself, but it's also a shame from an educational standpoint that uh, there isn't more encouragement of that kind of thing going on. A lot of composers still think, all I've got to do is learn how to write a super awesome 15-minute string quartet and I'm set, you know, and that's becoming less and less true as we go forward. Um, yes, and I think also when when composers who don't have a lot of experience seeing um, seeing other works in other disciplines, when they approach a collaborative project, they may not realize or they may assume that the music drives the project, um, mm -hmm. and you know that may be the case with an with an opera, but. Um, I don't think it's a great attitude to have. I mean, in a true collaboration, yes, the music influences the other work, but the other work also should influence the music. And nobody, uh, no, no single artist or single discipline gets, uh, you know, complete control. Although, of course, there should probably be someone who's sort of the ostensible leader. Um, the whole, you know, one of the great things about collaboration is that you're all influencing each other and. All of your work is shaping all of the other work, and and so uh, so I think one of the one of the problems with composers who don't see a lot of other work is that they they come to a collaboration with this with this mistaken idea that that their music is going to drive everything. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I sort of feel that that can be a problem, but oftentimes I feel like it's the reverse of that. Um, there's a certain level of taking taking for granted that goes on with music, and people in multimedia projects often, um, the example I use all the time is I do a lot of video editing, and in the sound uh, manipulation portion of the program I use called Sound Booth, it has a button called Auto Compose Score. Um, <laughs> so you put some, you put some well, parameters to What are you going to do? That's school what for. I do. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have that button yeah. on my computer, too. So I think that collaborations can be great, uh, but I think music sometimes gets, it's just considered as something that's going to be there and set the mood and it's going to do what they think the music needs to do. Mm -hmm. um, but to get the music more out in front to me seems 
less likely. Now, this is me and my experience of dealing with music without text, too. And when you're the composer and you're also generating or dealing with some sort of text, I can imagine that dynamic feeling different than it has for me in the past. Oh, that's a very good point. Um, I think I think you're right that a lot of um, a lot of artists working in theater and dance don't uh, don't always respect the role of the music as much as they should. Um, but th this is, you know, there are good collaborations and there are bad collaborations, and I think, um, or <laughs> there are successful ones and unsuccessful ones. Um, <laughs> and I think it is partly, you know, finding the right people to work with. Um, Knowing when you're going into a project that these are people who really like your music and know it and have listened to a lot of it and can talk to you about it um, in a way that makes you feel like they will respect uh, what you what you contribute as something that is you know that does play a major role in the collaborative project. Right. Well, I hate to be this way, but uh, we have to move on. Why you got to be like that? Readers, Why you got to be like that? that? We cover the news. Is there news? Oh, there is. We you know, I'm kind of actually tired story. of talking about Peter Gelb and the New York Metropolitan Opera. Um, but it was probably the the most talked about thing in the classical music news this last week. Um, and we've talked about Peter Gelb a couple of times, most recently a couple of weeks ago. Um, th but he's had a couple of weird run-ins with the media over the last year or so about a year ago we talked about um he, the metropolitan opera um requesting the met futures blog stop kind of preempting the metropolitan opera's announcement of their casts the met futures blog would kind of go and figure out through a series of other smaller announcements by individual singers who was going to be in a cast at the opera and they would it would be published there before the Met actually announced it and the Met didn't like people stealing their thunder and so this blog got taken down and then a couple of weeks ago uh, of course a lot of people have been critical of Robert LePage's production of The Ring cycle at the Met this last couple of seasons and uh, managing director Peter Gulb has taken a lot of heat for that um, and now that the cycle has kind of wrapped up there have been a lot of retrospectives on um, the uh, merits of the, mm. the ring cycle that was just produced. And uh, notably, a blog post on QXR that was not even really that critical, but for some reason, Gelb got his undies in a bunch about it and yelled at them, and they took the blog post down, which was journalistically a little sketchy, um, especially since the Met is a, an underwriter of WQXR. And yeah. then just this last week on, Here's I believe the big one. it was on Monday, um, the New York Metropolitan Opera uh, announced, or maybe it was not them, Opera News, uh, the largest classical music publication in the United States, announced that they were no longer going to be reviewing productions of the Metropolitan <laughs> Opera. And that's particularly strange because they are kind of the in-house magazine, so to speak, of the New York Metropolitan Opera. Um, that's like saying my funk band isn't going to have a bass player anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, they weren't going to have a bass player anymore. Uh, and so people got you know, read this announcement on Opera News and they thought, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And so a lot of people got up in arms about that. And then th the very next morning, it was announced that due to popular out due to popular uh, outcry over the decision made just 18 hours ago, we've changed our minds. <laughs> um, so, you know, score one for people's righteous indignation over <laughs> opera reviews. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now, wasn't, wasn't Gilb the guy that came up with the idea of doing uh, the HD broadcast of the mess, though? Yeah, and, and that's something that's so now that this is cooled down and people have had a few days to, uh, you know, chill out because people were, I think, rightfully upset that, you know, the Opera News was saying not nice things about the Met. And so now they won't be allowed to review Met shows anymore, uh, which is sketchy. But um, I think people have kind of and people were calling for peter gelb's head in those first couple of days but i think that cooler heads have prevailed and you're right he, he is kind of 
seen as the guy responsible for the live and HD broadcasts, which I think are pretty super because without them, I would never get to see any Met productions. And they're generating some income. Yeah, they're generating not not a ton of income, but you know, you know, eleven or twelve million dollars or something like that a year. So that do, that ain't do that nothing. four or five times a year do for four or five years, and you're talking about real money. I know, right? Yeah. I mean, that's almost enough for for half a machine to do the ring cycle. If, if you're interested in all of that stuff and want to hear a wrap-up of it, I suggest Alex Ross's piece about it. You, you, you can skip everything else and, and pretty much learn everything you need to know by reading that. Yeah. Or you could listen to this past week's Music is Hard with me and Tim Rosenberg. Uh, we, we talked about kind of we talked about the story a little bit and used it as a jumping-off point to talk about new journalism in general and how it, it is, is changing the relationship with the, the subjects. Uh, right. in, in the arts in particular mm-hmm. um where you know i have a slightly i have a slightly um different take on this situation which is oh go for it that i uh i actually feel like gelb has the right to do what he did mm-hmm. uh, i feel like it was a stupid move <laughs> but um i feel like he has the right to tell people to take things down he has the right to tell people that they're not welcome to review his uh productions um and w- w- the people that I fault is um, QXR for taking down the blog post. I totally agree. That's yeah. exactly and, what we said this week on, on, on the other show. And Opera News for, I mean, maybe Opera News did put up a fight, and maybe that's why the Times covered it on the front page. But, um, but it's, you know, it, if Peter Gelp wasn't such an ass, it would be, um, it would be a, an interesting conversation to have about the relationship between artists and, and critics and, and, mm-hmm whether or not it's okay to sort of ban certain critics from coming sure. to your productions or at least to express your extreme uh, or your, your wish that they wouldn't cover your productions anymore. Um, I don't, obviously, you can't censor them. Like, if they're going to buy a ticket and come and watch exactly. the show, then they should be able to publish something. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've had some experiences with, with reviewers who are just clueless and and lazy and if they and fortunately they've never reviewed anything of mine more than once <laughs> but if i found out that they were coming to review a performance of mine these same, the same person or people um i would probably say i don't want your coverage um i don't want you there and um they might still come and then i wouldn't i wouldn't do anything about that although i might say i might say in public that i requested that this person did not come and review the con- the concert or the performance but i think it's it, you know it's too bad that that gelb is such an ass because we could <laughs> have had an interesting conversation about um about you know what do you do when you see uh, that a critic or a certain publication has a very negative uh, continuously negative take on what you're doing and uh you know, and that's not helpful to you. Or, I mean, do you have a right to 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 encourage them to not come anymore? Right. Uh, I think I, this I think is a do. little bit of a different circumstance, though, because it's not just Opera News and it's not just QXR that were saying the ring sucked. It was a, yeah. a lot of people. I would say the vast yeah. majority of critics were yeah. not happy with the ring. Yeah. yeah, and and Gelb may have felt embattled by a sense that I mean Robert Lepage was a was a bold choice, um, and it may, I didn't see it, any of the ring, and uh, I'm not going to, but um, but I have seen some of Robert Lepage's work before, and I think it was a pretty bold move on Peter Gelb's part to pick him to do this cycle. Uh, the results may have been awful, but <laughs> I think he you know he 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 may feel. I mean, the other problem is that you, if you're working in the opera world, then you're, uh, especially if you're the Met, then you're picking, you're, you're kind of like a museum. You're picking these works of opera that are, you know, stale is the wrong word, sacred. Yeah. Uh, stale mass- is the right word. <laughs> masterpieces. <laughs> but it's, it's not a diplomatic way of putting it, but uh, <laughs> that are like masterpieces and you know, have a sacred importance to, to a lot of people who come to see opera and review yeah. opera. Mm-hmm. And so when they see something that they don't like, especially if it's something radical and, you know, it's about technology or something very 21st century, uh, I'm not surprised that a lot of, of, 
of the responses are stodgy. I mean, it's it's a it, it may they may be right. Um, and I think Alex Ross wrote a pretty negative review about it as well. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and and I I kind of I trust his his evaluation, but um, yeah. but I I think it's also fair to imagine that uh, Peter Gelb is is um, you know it, it feels like there's a fair number of people out there who just don't um, don't want their great sacred works trampled on by such a 21st century vision. Right. Um, I, I think actually the criticism view, was the opposite of that, though. I think most of the critics were saying that it wasn't very adventurous and that it was it was a very traditional presentation and they were hoping for something that was a little bit more creative. I mean, the, the, the machine was very creative, but the projections weren't very interesting and um, the the costumes were super traditional, and the the interpretation of the music was super traditional, uh, and I think that's actually the source of of a lot of of the criticism. That's interesting. Well, hmm. No matter what the merits of the production in and of itself, I think Gelb would have done himself a favor by sticking to his guns and not trying to silence people who didn't like it. Just say, well, that's your opinion, yeah. and that's what he went with. You know, I mean, it's not like he. he he doesn't have other things he can rest on. The HD broadcast is an example. Right. So anyway, please let's not talk about Gelb next week. So we're not. Gelb, I promise no Met stories for the next month. Well, you never Unless know how stupid a thing happens. he's going to do next. Yeah. So it depends how please far don't do anything stupid enough to make the show. Exactly. Exactly. The disco world suffered another loss um, uh, this week. It's Last a rough week couple of weeks. Yeah. So. Uh, Last week, Donna Summer and now Robin Gibb of the Bee Gees um, passed away at 62. Um, who added the, uh, the piece about this, the slate piece that uh, talks about disco and Donna Summer and Robin Gibb? I added that. I was wondering because uh, I, I didn't think anybody on the panel did. So uh, there's also. Um, Kurt's on the panel. <laughs> We'll, we'll have a link He's to that. Right <laughs> well, and, and any of the regular panelists. Um, Corey would be an irregular panelist. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, the first 15 minutes or so of an episode from uh, the Slate Culture Gab Fest. And uh, I haven't seen it, so, but I, uh, based on my conversation thus far, I trust uh, Corey's opinion imminently. So we'll have a link to that. <laughs> Um, also, I, a factoid, I was doing just a little bit of investigation when uh, the story of Robin Gibb dying uh, hit. Do you know who was the producer of the albums leading up to their biggest uh, set of hits during the disco time and through some of the disco period? Who's that? Sir George Martin was the producer of their, uh, those really? albums uh, of, you know, um, Beatles fame. Yeah. But anyway, that was That's interesting. Cool. We'll have links to that. Glass in Times Square. You um, too can premiere work by Philip Glass. Yes. If you were, um, if you, if that was something that was on your bucket list, you can <laughs> unbucket list that. Right. Right. You, now it's it's no it's no uh, secret to watchers of the show that I am not uh, the biggest fan of Philip Glass. However, I think this is a really cool idea. Um, as part of the uh, Make Music uh, New York concert series which schedules uh, hundreds of free that's like a concerts. big long crazy thing yeah and we've talked about it on a, on a couple of different occasions on different episodes of the show uh but in, in collaboration with that and to honor philip glass's 75th birthday he has written a piece based on an earlier work his digital opera monsters of grace um that's going to be performed uh by you know whoever shows up in Times square at the appointed time <laughs> Which what was that? June twenty first at six thirty p.m. Eastern time. Um, and you can we'll have a link to the NPR story about it. You can actually download the score and uh, go and perform it. They're also going to perform some uh, box stuff. So there's going to be other pieces. And those scores they're going to do uh, movements from the box B minor mass. And you can get those parts That's from. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, like I know. Philip Glass and then. <laughs> The B minor mass. <laughs> and, well, I think they're like, this is non trivial choral music to just like show up and perform, I think. Yeah, yeah, I downloaded the score and it's the Philip Glass score and it's not easy. Yeah. It's, uh, it's going to be tricky and yeah. so it'll be you're, interesting you're, to see. You're, 
Yeah, your average American Idol fan is not going to be able to just rip through this Philip yeah. Glass piece by looking at the score. It's 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 complex meter. There are eight parts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is not easy stuff. So let's let's hope you know. Some, it's some also serious unsurprisingly for Philip Glass, not very vocally comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. To sing. So. Right. Uh, so, I, but it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I think it's really cool, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how the um, how the you know, depending on how many people show up and how skilled they are, uh, and how much they sort of fill in the group with hired or skilled singers, if they do that, um, right. it'll be interesting to see how it sounds and how it comes off. And it would be even I... more interesting to see a video of the rehearsal process if the video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we've got I to, feel we've like got to, to do something like this, they have to be depending on a fair number of ringers. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's um, got to be like some big university choruses or something, right? Yeah. This can't be just. Well, I think we need to force Patrick to go down there and take a camera and, and yeah. from the beginning and get some uh, some rehearsal footage. Um, our man on the street in New York, Patrick, who's not with us this week. Who's who's not in New York. <laughs> he's not in new york this week um i think that you know i think if you take enough singers to hold it together rhythmically and to hear the parts combined with a bunch of people doing it very badly could actually yield a, a, a sound that i would find more appealing than an, a, your average Philip you Glass. and charles ives <laughs> yeah i mean because it's definitely going to be a lot of noise and there's going to be definitely be a lot of people not doing it very well but like you said there's probably going to be a, a, enough people doing it exactly right so that's going to be an interesting sound i can't wait to hear wonder... maybe they're placing the microphones in very strategic locations yeah. <laughs> or, or, maybe. or maybe he conceived of this piece with a certain amount of indeterminacy built in <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> I, I see what you did there nate indeterminacy is not usually what you would consider philip glass's bag <laughs> right he m much more very deterministy yeah is that a word um <laughs> This week in uh, on the New Music Box uh, blog section by Isaac Shankler. Did I get that? Yeah, Isaac Shankler wrote a piece called Indetermination, um, addressing the idea of indeterminacy. And it's a little confusing because it's indeterminacy in composition, but he also talks about um, sort of the general acceptance of improvisation in the classical music world, too. He seems to more be talking about improvisation than indeterminacy in general. Right. And, and his terminology kind of grates on me a little bit, like, um, for instance, using the word, invoking the, the, the idea of aleatoricism. Um, aleatoricism isn't indeterminate. Aleatoricism is a term that was invented by Boulez to describe music that he wrote that has multiple possible outcomes, but those multiple possible outcomes are completely determined. So it's multiple determination, not indeterminacy. And uh, and I don't think he spends any time talking about how indeterminacy is actually a component of most music. Um, he talks uh, about it in his own music. That's what he's an expert on. Well, well, well isn't the isn't the point of of his article uh, a, a partly a complaint about the fact that not enough musicians appreciate or understand indeterminacy? Did I misread that? No, yeah, you're. I, I I agree, and he's he's also kind of advocating for in for for more indeterminate for for more indeterminate scoring in particular, um, to for for composers to I think put a little bit more trust in the the performers that they're working with to treat their their creative work with care and make intelligent decisions on their own and not specify every um, you know little grain of of possible notation idiosyncrasy so i mean for me though i come down on the on the side of uh i mean i feel like indeterminacy is more it's not, it's less about openness which is what it seems he's arguing in the article and it's more about limitations and discipline and um if if you're looking for you know, if you're going to complain that not all performers know how to do that properly, then I feel like that's sort of missing. Like, like, why would you want all performers to be able to do that correctly? I mean, you've got to seek out the ones who can 
And that's what makes it special. That's what makes it experimental music. And, you know, is, is that it's not mainstream. It's not, you know, you're not going to find a lot of performers who, who have been taught to do it or who do it well. Mm -hmm. But there are those out there who I think will and can do it well. And so the complaint about why doesn't everyone like indeterminacy, why, doesn't, why don't all performing musicians understand it and appreciate it, if I'm reading that correctly, um, I, I didn't find that to be a very, um, I don't know, a, a compelling point to make. Um, yes. I also don't necessarily agree with his stipulation of the way the idea of indeterminacy is received. Um, I mean, I don't know how many different uh, venues or, or situations that he's basing his opinion on, but in my experience, you know, uh, it's it's either it's received or not received well based on how things turn out. I don't I haven't found any sort of tacit yeah. uh, resistance to the idea of indeterminacy in, in music. Uh, in my at least academic experience and it's not as though it's clear to the audience when you're playing something that's written on the page and when you're making something up right, right. You know, I, I teach a, a, a jazz studies class and i always have to make it very clear to my students like here this person is improvising here they're not and they they at first don't hear that distinction and really the only reason we we know the distinction at all in most recordings is because of an expectation of the form you right. know right um and it, it, it's it's not i don't think obvious just on listening the difference between something that's pre-composed and something that's improvised which again is i think what he's really talking about here it's improvisation he's not talking about yeah you know just randomly selecting things he's talking about people making intelligent decisions Right. Well, it's it's interesting because it, he uh, because there is a, a a very big distinction between improvisation and indeterminacy. Mm -hmm. And with indeterminacy, I think the composer um, has to make. I mean, it's it's really hard, I think, to make a successful piece that involves indeterminacy because you have to make as a composer a lot of choices about what the limitations are going to be, and you've got to create a situation um, in which many if not all possible outcomes are going to be consonant with your yes you know with whatever your your uh your musical goal is with the piece mm -hmm. and i think a lot of times indeterminacy indeterminacy is used as a, a, a as a as a shortcut to uh to get pieces uh you know sort of finished and tweaked by performers and i i think that's you know i think indeterminacy should never be mistaken and performers should never be able to mistake it for improvisation there should be no sense in a truly indeterminate piece that you're improvising as a performer um right but that's just my take on it and i'm i'm a no. big cage fan so i'm coming at it from a very cagian perspective Right, and, yeah. and I think when you when when I think about writing something like this, I try to think of all the possible interpretations of it, and if if there if there are a significant number of those that I don't think I would want, then I didn't notate it very well. Mm -hmm. And like you said, right. it's very tricky to 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 ask exactly for the thing that you want uh, while still yielding something. Um, the yeah, to me, it's if you compose a piece that's going to rely on indeterminacy, it's, you end up doing the same thing that Bach did. Bach wrote pieces that had a lot of indeterminate elements and relied on performance practice to fill in the gaps. Um, take a piece by Christian Wolff did this a lot as an example. He basically will write a piece and write a system of, uh, you know, come up with something to, for the, comp uh, the performers to read and a way that the performers are supposed to interact and then explains a performance practice to them. So instead of relying on the performance practice that's like sort of the, the heritage of a tradition, like with Baroque music, he says, okay, here's this music, and I'm going to explain the performance practice to you, the things that guide the indeterminate elements in performance. Um, and to me, that's the thing you have to do is say it's indeterminate to, to specifics, but here's the performance practice that needs to guide you through the performance, if that makes any sense. It, little <laughs> no it makes it makes sense uh christian wolf is a really special case um <laughs> but um but i think it's it's also i mean it can be as a performer it, 
it can be very, very satisfying to realize a, a, an indeterminate work. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I think the trick is that you you have to find performers who are not interested in sort of virtuosity in the traditional sense of the word, and who are definitely not interested in their own egos as a part of the performance. Um, because I think, I mean, unless uh, even even when it's a solo piece. Um, it's um, it's not about you. It's not about the musician. It's about the you know the way the piece unfolds and the the choices that you make. Not the improvisations that you do, but the choices that you make as a performer, mm -hmm. um, and how those affect either the ensemble as a whole or the piece as a whole. Um, and that can be really rewarding. Like in a theater company that I work in, for example, we often will do. Um, do improvs, not indeterminate things, but improvs uh, within very strict limitations. And then um, we'll do those in rehearsals, and then we will set things that happen in the course of those improvs so that we end up with a piece, the theatrical piece that's almost completely set, but that was developed through uh, improvisation and still has some indeterminate elements in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a there's a good you know. Uh, I think I'm just rambling now, but uh, maybe okay. I, should, I should stop. <laughs> I think I think it's probably uh, we're running a little long, but that's that's fine. Yeah. It's been a really great discussion. Okay. Let's move on to the pick of the week. Our pick of the week, of course, by uh, our guest Corey Dargle. Um, this is a piece called "Last Words from Texas," uh, and it is settings of. Um, the the last words of uh, inmates who were executed in the state of Texas. Uh, so, Corey, do you want to introduce this piece at all? I know we kind of mentioned it several times at, at the top of the show. Yeah, I mean, there's not much to be said uh, beyond what you said. Um, it's a uh, it's a uh, verbatim settings of the last statements of executed offenders put to death by the state of Texas. Um, I, uh, I was inspired to write this piece because the state of Texas has made available on its um, its website all of these last statements, which it's is kind of a shockingly very, morbid. A, a, a very uh, confusing and upsetting thing. I don't know why they did it. Um, I have I have guesses, but um, I won't. This is the same people that clapped when they talked about how many people they had killed in Texas at the debates. Yeah. So uh, so I. Uh, I went through all 500 or so, a little less than 500 uh, of the people that they have killed and looked at the last things that they had to say and, um, and found ones that I thought were uh, unusual in some way, were particularly pedestrian, were somewhat poetic. Um, I tried to find a, a variety of ones that, that, really, that stood out for some reason. Um, and then I, um, I set them to music with synthesizers and, and my own singing voice. Um, and so the, I think we're going to play the first one, the first song, um, which is... Um, oh, and I also should say that I did no research on the criminals, and I still don't know what they were convicted of doing. Um, but I just thought that this was a really... Um, it was... This is, you know, this follows my, my usual process of... Of, of taking things that are alienating and that we might not first be able to relate to and finding something moving and um, and sort of deeply human about them. Um, so I won't say anything else since we're running long. That's all right. <laughs> uh, so here's uh, an excerpt from the last words from Texas. This is the first, uh, the first section uh, Titled with, I guess, just the date the person was executed. Date of execution. Yeah, I was I was advised not to use the names of the criminals for legal oh, okay. reasons. So each each song is the title of each song is the date of execution of the person whose words I'm setting. Okay. So this is May 13, 2010.
all eight songs of this of this album are now being arranged for the acoustic ensemble, the amplified acoustic ensemble, uh, New Speak, mm. and will be sung not by me, but by Melissa Hughes, the soprano I was mentioning earlier. And that premiere is happening in November in Washington, D.C., um, and will probably be played at other places subsequently. Uh, so I'll, you know, follow my website and see if there's anything near you uh, if you're interested in hearing an acoustic arrangement of that piece. Yeah. I am. And <laughs> so this is so these these arrangements are based on these electronics that you that you created, right? Yeah, that came first. Okay. Right. Are they different in any kind of fundamental ways or are they sort of just instrumentation versions of what's already there? Uh there there's there's no real differences there. They're just orchestrations. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and we should say that you can listen to this this whole thing on Corey's website. Uh, yeah, it's all free. It's a free download. You can stream it or download it. Yeah. And um, we'll, we'll I have had links an interesting to that. experience when I when I first listened to this first piece, and that's why I'm glad we did that one because my it was great because my very first sensation, and it was because of my mood or whatever. But I turned it on and I'm like, oh, is it really going to do this? Because I hear a synthesizer going, uni uni uni, and like that lasted for like one second because then I heard, oh, he's going to be messing with that the whole time. Well, that's cool. So like it's sort of like you know if you've heard dance music that uses synthesizers for like 0.5 seconds, you think. Well, this is just some stupid dance song, you know, where the synthesizer is going to go up and down. And then hearing that kind of sound have that plastic of a quality applied to the tempo was really cool. Yeah. I only a few, only a very few people can dance to this song, I've discovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It takes a lot of practice, I bet. Yeah. Or a lot of beer or both. <laughs> um, so that's actually something I wanted to ask. When you do shows, Corey, what are the. Because well, um, it certainly doesn't gonna it isn't gonna come across as like a stodgy string quartet performance to the audience. So do you did is their reaction seem to be more like what you'd expect for a you know a, a pop act, or do they sit there in solemn silence listening to the art music? Uh, well, it depends on the venue, um, and I've been very careful lately to choose venues where people are there to listen. Um, yeah. So they do tend to pay attention. Um, and it also happens that even though uh, almost all of my work is amplified, um, it, it's also quiet on the quieter side. Mm -hmm. So it does require a lot of, um, you know, uh, an, an audience that's there to listen, uh, where I don't have to compete for their attention. So that's important to me. Um, uh, and I also do, for that reason as well, I do a lot of works in theater and uh you know, in, in venues like black box theaters and places where people are, you know, in a in a in an environment. Um, hopefully, they can have drinks while they're listening, but um, they're in an environment that's that's fairly formal compared to your, uh, you know, compared to a bar concert or a club concert. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I also try to have a uh, and have been told that I have a, a very strong stage presence. So um, that's important to me, and it's important to me to work with musicians who also have a strong stage presence and who take that into account as performing artists. Yeah. Um, so the people should check out the video on your the the featured video on your website right now is uh, you performing live, and you're doing what is it? More last words from Texas. Is that the name of it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about, actually. Um, the uh, one where you're performing, it looks like you're dressed up like a nightclub singer, sort of. Oh, hold on. I should have prepared this question better. Sorry. I don't know what you're talking about, either. Oh, heck. And I don't have your actual page pulled up. Well, I think I, um, you, maybe you're talking about the, the, the violin pieces that I did with Todd Reynolds, no? No, it's the one where there's a piano player who's not really oh, playing piano. Oh, 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 yeah, that's from Removable Parts. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's a that piece is a theater piece, so a yeah. music theater piece. So it has that, um, you know, that stage presence and all those kinds of things built into it. Uh, well, and you were talking not about to mention, stage. I'm talking about stage presence, but but that piece also represents uh, has a visual component, costumes, lighting design. All sorts of great stuff that that pulls people in um, and doesn't really, you know, uh, unless they're completely turned off by it for some reason, doesn't really allow them not to pay attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, I, I watched that. I watched everything on your uh, page, by the way, and it, it made me wonder if you have an interest in multimedia, not as necessarily collaboration, but like, do you do video editing or anything like that yourself? Oh God! I mean, when I when I've tried to do it, it's been a disaster. Um, <laughs> it takes me, I think, probably ten times as long as a, an actual video editing person to do, you know, to to do that. But I, I'm not really. Um, yeah, I'm not really interested in in new media. If that's what you mean by like, right? Uh, um, I don't really know what that term means anymore. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, you know, like working on like interactive website stuff, and is that is that what you're talking about, or not really? Sam, you're muted. Anything that's not considered like normal composerly activity, like video editing or that kind of stuff. I was just curious because oh, you have. Because you have quite a few pieces that are multimedia pieces that uh, I found on your website, so I was just curious. No, no, I only edit my own performance videos. Uh, I don't, I don't do any other um, other video work. Uh, the only other, the only work outside of music that I do is with um, the theater company that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you definitely have a commanding stage presence, and you're lucky that you're you're a damn handsome man too, because that helps out. <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> and we'll leave it on that creepy note. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's not creepy. It's just that I'm really fuzzy, so it's easy to call me handsome when I'm very fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> if if we had the money to afford HD, we would all see how ugly Corey is. <laughs> no, I've got this big like zit on my head here, which you can't see because it's all fuzzy. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us this morning, Corey. We had a great time talking to you. Yeah. Me too. Thank you for having me. Uh, you should check out Corey's site for any information about upcoming performances or uh, a lot of you have a lot of recordings of, of your stuff uh, available on the web, and and we'll have links to that and many other things. Uh, in our show notes this week you can find those at soundnotion.tv slash sn um, you can also find us on twitter as at soundnotion and of course all of us individually are on twitter Corey is at dargle on twitter uh, we do this show every sunday around 11 eastern time uh, and you can catch the live stream at soundnotion.tv slash live and there's a chat room there uh, for you to enjoy uh, uh, one another's company and maybe participate in our conversation that way uh, as it's happening this show and all our shows are available in the itunes store so be sure to go there and subscribe for free and download every episode automatically sound notions introduction includes music by patrick gulo and video by tyler left thanks again for watching and we'll see you next week <laughs>